From the world of politics to the world of business, this is Balance of Power. Live from Washington, D.C. From Bloomberg's Washington, D.C. studios to our TV and radio audiences worldwide, welcome to Balance of Power. Alongside Kaylee Lyons, I'm Joe Matthew. The Supreme Court delivers a win for Donald Trump in a unanimous decision, ruling he will remain on the ballot in Colorado and across the country. Colorado Secretary of State Jenna Griswold will give us her reaction this hour. Super Tuesday, just a day off now with 16 states holding nominating contests and Donald Trump holding a commanding lead over Nikki Haley. We'll speak with a key Haley supporter coming up, New Hampshire Governor Chris Sununu. And negotiations over a ceasefire in Gaza and the war between Israel and Hamas are on hold as questions over hostages persist. We'll get perspective from Jonathan Panikoff of the Atlantic Council. So, Joe, happy Monday on what is going to yeah. be an incredibly busy week here in Washington and beyond. Not only do you have Super Tuesday tomorrow, the State of the Union Thursday, a potential right. partial government shutdown that could begin midnight Friday. But we started this Monday with news from the Supreme Court as it relates to the former president. Yeah, pretty unusual to get a tip on a Sunday evening that a ruling is coming Monday morning. But that's exactly how the week began. And President Trump reacted to the Supreme Court decision today to allow him on the ballot following challenges on the 14th Amendment. Here he is. I want to start by thanking the Supreme Court for its unanimous decision today. It was a very important decision. We're very well crafted. And I think it will go a long way toward bringing our country together, which our country needs. Joining us now for more on that story and our other top stories this evening, Bloomberg's Greg Store, Nancy Cook, and Dan Flatley. But Greg, we begin with you as you report on the Supreme Court for us here at Bloomberg. It's worth noting that while, yes, all nine justices ruled that he should remain on the ballot in Colorado and everywhere else, they didn't make a decision about the question of insurrection and whether or not he engaged in it. This essentially was a decision that said it's not up to individual states. It's up to Congress. Yeah, exactly right. Uh, Donald Trump had uh, one of the reasons that, that folks thought going in that he was likely to win this case was he had a lot of different ways to win it. One of those ways was the court could have said, hey, he didn't actually engage in insurrection. The court went a different direction, instead said the power to, to take him off the ballot, the states don't have that power. As you said, it's up to Congress to decide how to enforce the insurrection clause. What is the actual argument here, the insurrection clause that was written after the Civil War? This was intended to keep Confederates from, from holding office, right? Yeah, exactly. And it says that, that somebody who served in the government, either state or federal, took an oath to support the Constitution and then engaged in insurrection, those are key words, mm -hmm. um, can't then take office again. And so the question was, does that apply in this circumstance that no, nobody was really thinking about at the time of the 14th Amendment, but in the circumstance where Donald Trump uh, allegedly incited the January 6th riot? Well, and of course, we heard Trump heralding this decision from the court at Mar-a-Lago earlier today. He also pointed, though, to another case the court will have to decide that pertains to him, and that's his immunity question here in Washington, whether or not he is immune from prosecution as a former president in Jack Smith's 2020 election subversion case. Those arguments are scheduled for April 22nd. Should we draw a line between the timeline it took for the court to hear arguments and then rule in this case to a similar timeline potentially in that case, or was because of the deadline, Colorado's primary being tomorrow, that this happened so quickly? I wouldn't assume that the court will decide that case as quickly as it decided this case. Here, we had Super Tuesday. Um, as Joe said, uh, pretty unusual to get word on a Sunday that the court's going to issue opinions on Monday. And this wasn't an, a day where they were normally scheduled to take the, take the bench. And in fact, this opinion was not handed down from the bench. It was handed out uh, just on the court's website and, and hard copies in the press office. So th they clearly were trying to meet that deadline of Super Tuesday. With the in immunity case, yes, there's a focus on the election, whether there will be a trial and a verdict before the election. But the court doesn't have any sort of immediate deadline like that that would prompt them to say, oh, we need to get a ruling out by such and such date. Yeah. Thanks for helping us understand, as always. Greg Storr getting us started here on Balance of Power. Meantime, former President Trump picking up more delegates in the Republican primary, even as Nikki Haley wins her first race. It happened over the weekend. 
This is the candidates prepared to face off in tomorrow's Super Tuesday races, a major stop on the road to the White House here. Let's bring in Bloomberg's Nancy Cook for more now. There's a lot of talk, Nancy, on Nikki Haley's last stand, essentially, tomorrow. The math is going to become very difficult for her uh, if the polls are correct. Absolutely. What we have to remember is that one of the reasons Super Tuesday is such a big deal is that more than a third of the delegates uh, that a candidate needs to clinch the Republican nomination are awarded tomorrow night. And that includes in, in very large states like California. We are expecting Donald Trump to, you know, really sweep those states. And that will put him, it won't necessarily, he won't clinch the nomination officially after tomorrow. But if he does as well as we expect, it will make the path for her to take, get the nomination basically impossible. The only contest that she's won so far has been in Washington, D.C. Yeah, 1,215 delegates are needed. The math just doesn't dictate that Trump could secure them tomorrow, but he very well could by the time March is out. Is there, though, any, any number we should look at that would suggest that the, president, the former president's candidacy may be in more trouble in a general election scenario should he be the Republican nominee? Is there a margin that would suggest trouble for him in the Republican base? I wouldn't say that, that sort of the delegate count or what he, uh, you know, how much he wins by a margin will suggest his vulnerabilities. I think that we can see the vulnerabilities in a lot of the polling that we have seen. Even in the Bloomberg News Morning Consult poll, which came out last week, it really, I think, highlighted some of his issues. Issues. Uh, you know, there were a, pers- a number of people who said that they thought he was dangerous. You know, yeah. that that is a big deal. That's a real red flag to the campaign. The other thing that I'm hearing from Trump officials is that they're very worried about their standing with white suburban women, given all of the Democrats' focus on reproductive rights and, uh, you know, problems of abortion access in a, a number of states. And so they're really worried about sort of reaching that population. And so I think that we can see some of the warning signs already. But, you know, just with Republican primary voters, Trump remains very popular and a movement figure. Nikki Haley was asked about the pledge uh, on Sunday morning television, whether she would endorse Donald Trump if, in fact, he ended up being the nominee. And they had to take that pledge Mm -hmm. to get on the debate stage. Of course, Donald Trump was not one of them, and he didn't show up in any debates. Uh, She's signaling, I think we can say, that she might not be prepared to do that as the RNC takes on new leadership. Will it matter at that point? I mean, I think that she has um, sort of alienated Trump's MAGA base so much that I'm really not sure if it matters if she endorses him. And I think that the people who have been funding her campaign and also supporting her, you know, a lot of uh, college educated, wealthier Republicans, a lot of big donors, you know, who read Bloomberg, who are in finance, support her. People who are just very loath to back Trump regardless. I feel like that's not really the audience that's going to run to rush to um, support him. All right, Bloomberg's Nancy Cook joining us this evening ahead of a trip to Mar-a-Lago for Super Tuesday (laughs) tomorrow. Thank you so much. In the meantime, Vice President Kamala Harris spoke over the weekend in Selma, Alabama, calling for a temporary ceasefire between Israel and Hamas. Given the immense scale of suffering in Gaza, there must be an immediate ceasefire for at least the next six weeks which is what is currently on the table. Joining us now is Bloomberg's Dan Flatley, who reports on national security matters for us. So, Dan, as we heard from the vice president, a six-week ceasefire is on the table, and yet talks are not progressing because of issues, including Israel's trying to verify the status of hostages held by Hamas. Just how difficult are these negotiations right now? Uh, Kaylee, these these negotiations are incredibly difficult. Uh, you're still dealing with an active war zone, essentially, in, in Gaza. Um, you're dealing with two sides that don't really trust each other uh, in the Israelis and, and uh, the leadership of Hamas. Um, and you're dealing with a fraught political situation here in the U.S. where you have the Biden administration that obviously uh, is coming under fire for not being harder on, on the Israeli government in terms of uh, the humanitarian toll of this uh, offensive in Gaza. So uh, there's a lot of uh, things going on in the background. Um, the Israeli opposition leader, Benny Gantz, is here uh, in Washington this week to, to meet with officials. Uh, there's some friction there between him and uh, Benjamin Netanyahu. So this It's a very complicated situation. There does seem to be the framework for some sort of ceasefire, uh, as uh, Vice President Harris mentioned, uh, on the order of about six weeks. But whether they can actually reach an agreement and and bring that to fruition anytime soon is very much
much up in the air at this point. Dan, Israel says it will not send negotiators to Cairo to talk about a ceasefire until it gets a list of all the hostages and their conditions. Will Hamas uh, be trusted to provide that information? It's very difficult to say, Joe, at this point. I mean, obviously, there's a trust issue here, as I mentioned earlier, and, and seeing a list or seeing some sort of, uh, you know, proof of life, so to speak, in advance of any kind of talks is, is paramount. But, you know, I think from the Israeli perspective, too, even if you see that on paper, how, how could you really trust that, just looking at it from their perspective? And we also had a U.N. report recently about uh, sexual violence on October 7th and, mm -hmm. and some other sort of uh, very, uh, you know, uh, damning uh, reports and evidence uh, around that event. So it really has to kind of go uh, proceed in a very step-by-step uh, -step basis, and you need to establish that trust. And right now, they, they don't have that at the moment. All right, Dan, we thank you. Bloomberg's Dan Flatley keeping us up to date. And coming up on Balance of Power, back to the campaign trail and Nikki Haley's political future and a conversation with New Hampshire Governor Chris Sununu. It's next on Balance of Power, Bloomberg TV and Radio. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg TV and radio. I'm Joe Matthew, alongside Kaylee Lyons in Washington. With just one day left until Super Tuesday, Republican Governor Chris Sununu of New Hampshire spoke with us about this election cycle and specifically his support for Nikki Haley. And we began our conversation with an eye on tomorrow's elections and whether Haley can stay competitive, as she put it herself. Here's what he had to say. Well, I, it really comes down to what, what actually happens, right? So uh, in most of these states, there's a couple things to remember. First, the campaigns really haven't been in these states other than for the first couple weeks, right? They, they just kind of see what they've been uh, given on national media. But Nikki's hitting the ground. She's working very hard, state to state, town to town, doing the retail politics. And everywhere she goes, her numbers go up. Every time Nikki comes in a room, her poll numbers get better. There's more opportunity there. So uh, you can't say that for the former President Trump. But everywhere Nikki goes, it only gets better. So it's, it's a little bit of a, of a race against the clock. So what will happen is she's allocated a lot of resources, a lot of opportunity to all the Super Tuesday states. They'll kind of see where they go, where what the results are. Um, it isn't if you win this many states or that many states, then you go or don't go. You kind of have to look at what's coming ahead, how you're going to allocate whatever resources you have, your ability to raise more money, the messaging that's going to come out of it, the demographics and rules in each of those states, because they're all different, right? So um, every campaign kind of has various inflection points. The day after Super Tuesday is a big one, uh, obviously for Nikki Haley and for Donald Trump about what the next move is. So, I mean, I, I don't know if there's a, an exact number you can put on it. It's kind of a, okay, here's where we are, here's what we got left, and here's where the opportunity really lies. Interesting. The Trump campaign seems to think they will be able to call Donald Trump the presumptive nominee, that they'll actually hit the magic number by the 19th of March at the latest. Governor, I wonder if that matches your math. You're talking about a rapidly closing window. If that's the case, is this yeah. Nikki Haley's last stand tonight? No, look, look, they've been calling Trump the presumptive nominee since, be, you know, be, before Iowa. Are you kidding me? I mean, they actually tried to pass a resolution in the RNC that he should just be the presumptive nominee yeah, because right. a couple elites in Washington This would be actual numbers, though. Say, this would be actually on the way to 1215. Yeah, sure. Look, at some point, I mean, one of the candidates is going to cross the, the kind of the magic number of kind of having enough delegates to drive forward on the convention. That obviously goes into the, the calculus and the calculation in terms of what states come next. So um, you, you'll excuse me if I don't trust the Trump math. Um, I did that in 2016 when he said he was going to be the most fiscally responsible president in history. And he was in an ap absolute embarrassment, you know, when it came to fiscal responsibility. So Trump and math, uh, they don't do so well. They don't mix so well together. So I'll back off of that other than to say Nikki's working hard, going to collect as many delegates as possible, try to win a few states on Super Tuesday, trying to garner enough support to keep some momentum going uh, so that, again, she can stay competitive in what goes forward. OK, so talking about math, Governor Nikki Haley likes to tout that she is an accountant. And to Joe's point, it's not clear that there is math that exists that could get her to 1215 the way things are going right now. So if it's not actually about getting the, the number of delegates to secure the nomination, what other reason is there? For her to stay in this race, is this really about 2028? Is it about no, being there, an there alternative is no other no, to Trump? Should yeah, he be convicted yeah. of a felony? 
Yeah. No, the, the, no, the reason to stay in the race is to collect enough delegates to, to be president. That's Nikki's mission. That's it. She's not here to make a point. She's not putting herself on the line, spending all this energy, all this exhaustion away from her family, you know, being out there every single day tirelessly, you know, for anything other than being president and getting this country back on track. And that's exactly what you want to see. So, no, it's not about some of these other candidates who get in just to try to make a point or sell a book or whatever the heck it is. Nikki is about focusing on this country and what she can bring to the table, not just as, uh, from the country country's perspective. But as a Republican, I love the fact that she doesn't just win. She wins handily against Joe Biden. She brings senators and new House members and governorships all with her. She wins up and down the ballot. Trump cannot do that. Ambassador Haley signaled yesterday she might not endorse Donald Trump in an interview on Meet the Press that she no longer sees herself bound to a pledge uh, to an RNC that she sees changing here. Of course, it is changing as we speak, Governor. Do you support that decision? Do you feel the same way? Well, she didn't say she wouldn't. She's definitely not going to. So she didn't say that. They, they, you know, when the press is asking you as a candidate, if you're going to support the person you're running against, it's a ridiculous question, right? To say, oh, yeah, by the way, and, okay. I'll, and I'll support the, the person I'm, I'm running well, I'm, against. I'm trying to that be careful. She signaled that she candidate. might not. I'm, I'm trying to be fair here, Governor. She yeah, signaled she, she might not. Look, yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah. She said she might not. And again, yeah, it's a ridiculous question also because is Trump, has he committed to supporting the Republican nominee if it's not him? I Hell think no. you know the of answer. Of course he to that. hasn't. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, of course. So so it's it's this faux outrage. I can't believe that she wouldn't answer the question or be clear about it when Trump has gotten away with completely, you know, kicking uh, kicking dirt in the face of the Republican Party across this country, kind of making his own rules as he goes, but he gets away with it. So, look, at the end of the day, I mean, Nikki will decide what Nikki's going to do, uh, you know, regardless of, of who the nominee is. You're going to see a lot of folks understand that Joe Biden doesn't is not the future of America, right? I mean, that's a real problem for a whole variety of reasons. We could do an hour on a show about why that's a problem. Yeah. Um, there's a reason why Trump, you know, actually is neck and neck with Biden. The problem is, again, it's not just about who wins the presidency. It's about who brings the rest of the party over the line. And I keep going back to that, but it's so important. We're tired of, as Republicans, we are tired of losing. And we lost in 20. We lost in 22. We lost with Trump as the standard bearer and kind of the, 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 the front end and the messenger of the party, his type of candidates, his style. That is complete losing uh, for the Republican Party. Um, so he could, he could snake by, I guess, but Nikki would win it in droves. At the end of the day... I, again, I, I kind of I thought it was kind of funny that they would even ask her the question because she's still very much in this race. She's still fighting hard a couple of days from Super Tuesday. And all she's trying to do is mm -hmm. is get more voters out. Every new voter that comes out that typically might not vote in a primary that comes out on Super Tuesday is likely a Nikki Haley voter. So getting the vote, getting the vote out, not just kind of to push back against this you know concerted base that Trump has. And that's understandable, be given that he's an incumbent president. But the, every new voter she can drive out is another uh, bit of opportunity. And that's all you're thinking about as a candidate. How do you win? Well, what about what you're thinking about as a surrogate? Because, Governor, you've been asked the question. In fact, Joe and I have asked it of you when we were up in New Hampshire in January, this idea that you would support Trump should he be the Republican nominee as an alternative to Joe Biden. As you just described him as someone kicking dirt in the face of Republicans, I believe there is a very real chance he could be convicted of a felony in the not-so-distant future. Is there anything that would change your mind on that? Uh, right now, no, look, I, I, look, I want a strong ticket. And my focus is, is going to be, I'm not going to be governor. I've, I've done my four terms here. Um, I'm deciding to step down. My focus is always going to be, you know, in New Hampshire. And I'm just kind of speaking where my position as a governor, I think you can translate it to 49 other states. Party leaders and folks that are elected are going to focus really hard on their states. The problem with Trump is that he's not going to be able to raise money because he's already spent, what, $60 million on his legal fees, probably another $50 million to go. Um, his people have now co-opted and are now running the RNC. So, again, who's going to give the RNC money knowing that a lot of that money might just go to pay off his legal fees? It's going to put a lot of pressure on candidates to raise money into their own PACs, into their own organizations, um, where typically they might have relied on the RNC for help. I just don't see that as actually being there. So, look, I'm going to support the Republican Party, the Republican ticket as strong as I can. I'm a conservative. I believe in those ideals. I believe I'm, I'm very optimistic about the Republican Party, whether Trump's there or not. There, there's still a lot of opportunity to get things right in this country, to get back to b believing that the individual comes first, not a bunch of liberal elitists in Washington that are standing on the shoulders of American families that built this country, defend this country, uh, but are being told how to live their lives. People are absolutely sick and tired of it. So the Republican Party has a huge opportunity to have candidates, not just 
who's running for president, but have candidates up and down the ballot that connect with that and say, we're going to actively make a change. We're not just going to go and raise more money, try to get ourselves reelected, but we're going to be an active part of a positive process that gets this country back on track. Governor Nikki Haley won Washington, D.C.'s primary over the weekend. I realize that may not be Republican country, but she's the first ever woman to win a Republican primary contest. I feel like we should say that out loud at some point in this conversation. Trump campaign has crowned her the queen of the swamp. What would you call it? Well, Trump, remember that that swamp Trump was going to drain, draining the swamp? That was yeah. his line. I, I don't I'm still waiting for it, man. I, I really am. So that, if you want to criticize the swamp, it only exists because Trump had uh, the inability, the bad management and, and couldn't do the job. Nikki's the, Nikki, the, the swamp fears Nikki Haley. Washington fears Nikki Haley because she doesn't take, you know, she doesn't take crap off anybody. And she's going to, you know, limit the bureaucracy, cut through the, 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 the process and the protocols that kind of, you know, stick this country, um, you know, back from, you know, really making development and, and, and you know, moving everything forward. She breaks through that because she did it as a governor. She was the Tea Party governor. And, yeah, she was, a, you know, the first female woman of color governor of a, of a southern state. Um, she she kind of carries that expertise. She carries the international piece. She is the full package. And then you just add the fact that she's incredibly likable. That's why independents like her so much, right? That's why they're coming on board, because she's so likable as an individual. She has such connectivity with the voters out there. Um, that's why even against an incumbent president, she's getting 40, 45 percent of the vote in some of these states, because there's a lot of Republicans in the base that are just saying, you know what, we got to move on. We have an opportunity for the next generation of leadership in this country. We got to move on and make it happen. That was our conversation with New Hampshire Governor and Nikki Haley surrogate Chris Sununu as we look ahead to Super Tuesday with a focus on domestic politics here in the U.S. But we also have our eyes on politics overseas, including in China, where the premier will not be holding a press briefing at the country's annual parliamentary meetings. That briefing had been in place since 1993. Let's go now live to Hong Kong and Yvonne Mann, co-anchor of Bloomberg's new program, The China Show. She is joining us now. So, Yvonne, if we're not going to get Lee's briefing, what will we get? out of this year's NPC. Well, we're going to get that work report from the premier, Kaylee, which happens on Tuesday here uh, in Hong Kong, Beijing time, around you know, just a few hours from here, really. And that's going to be the key focus. And in fact, investors are probably going to be leaning much more into this speech now that you mentioned that there will be no annual press conference uh, and really breaking away from 30 years of norms, as you had mentioned there. And, and this was seen, these press conferences, as a rare platform for the premier to kind of relay the policy direction for the next few years. It was also a chance for the number two to develop a more informal rapport with the public. And this coming at a time when you know, she is trying to rebuild confidence into this economy that is struggling with the real estate crisis and also geopolitical tensions with the U.S. It also comes at a time when President Xi is consolidating his power and continues to do so here as he secures that third historic term as well. So we, we have seen the premier, you know, been dispatched to the G20 for example but over the years we also have seen the role of the premier being diminished as well as of course she tries to elevate and put more sort of parties uh, that overlook and dom and what you know uh, policy decisions that used to be dominated mm -hmm. by the premier as well. We did hear from the foreign ministry spokeswoman that did defend that move of scrapping that regular press briefing. She did say, I know that you worry about non-openness and non-transparency, she said. Those worries are un unnecessary. That said, the end of an era, is there any other instance, any other scenario in which a senior government official is interacting with the media like this anywhere in China? Um, you know, I, we're, we're still going to see the foreign minister, for example, Wang Yi. He's going to be still having that press briefing at the end of this NPC. Mm -hmm. So that's still something that we need to look at as well. As we've been talking about and reporting about as well, we've been looking at the agenda for the NPC this year. One item that was scrapped was an area to discuss personnel appointments. So what does that mean? That's a rare omission, too, in this agenda. It's, it identifies or it indicates in some ways that perhaps we might not be hearing any sort of personnel changes regarding the new foreign minister, who that may be. Yeah. Uh, and so certainly that is something that we're watching very closely, what this means for U.S. and China relations. Maybe not too much here, given that Wang Yi has retook that role once again. So we might be seeing some continuity, but it also may mean he may be staying in that role for some time. Well, we're looking forward to the conversation on the China show 
with a lot ahead this week. Yvonne Mann, thank you for joining us. Host of the new Bloomberg TV program, The China Show. We thank you for joining us this evening. Coming up, we're joined by Jonathan Panikoff from the Scowcroft Middle East Security Initiative. This is Bloomberg. Your remarks yesterday got a lot of attention because they were pretty sharp against Israel. Is there any distance between you and President Biden on this issue? The President and I have been aligned and consistent from the very beginning. Israel has a right to defend itself. Far too many Palestinian civilians, innocent civilians have been killed. We need to get more aid in. We need to get the hostages out. And that remains our position. That was Vice President Kamala Harris speaking to reporters earlier today, a day in which she met with Israeli War Cabinet member Benny Gantz. And of course, over the weekend, she pushed for a six-week ceasefire on the grounds of the humanitarian catastrophe, in her words, happening in Gaza right now. Joining us to discuss this further is Jonathan Panikoff, director of the Scowcroft Middle East Security Initiative at the Atlantic Council and former deputy national intelligence officer for the Near East at the National Intelligence Council. Jonathan, thank you so much for being with us this evening. As we speak, there is not yet forward progress on the aforementioned ceasefire agreement. It would be six weeks, and yet Israel is not sending negotiators to Cairo uh, because of essentially what they say is a lack of validation about the number and condition of hostages. How hard is it going to be to get Israel the information that it needs from Hamas? Do you see this getting over the finish line anytime soon? Well, thanks for so much for having me. I, I think it can get over the finish line. Ramadan, which begins Sunday night, is really the time that they're trying to push for to get it done before then. I mean, the challenge is Israel has accepted the framework broadly of what a hostage negotiation would look like. Hamas is refusing to give a list of those hostages that would be released. Part of the reason may be because Hamas may not know all of them and where they are. Hamas is holding certainly probably the majority of hostages, but there's still a number that are probably held by other um, groups in Gaza Strip, Islamic Jihad, for instance. And so that may be part of the delay. There's also a history of Hamas, frankly, just lying about how many hostages have been killed, how many may be alive. I think Israel's right to want to validate it. I think it probably can get done with the Egyptians and Qataris as a mediator, but it's going to be a, a struggle, especially to do it by Sunday night. Jonathan, what did you make of the tone that we heard in the language from the vice president? She chose to deliver that message from Selma, which is not lost on us days before Joe Biden delivers his State of the Union address. Can you project to what we're going to hear Thursday night in a potentially more forceful President Biden? I think you're going to hear a fairly similar message, but as you said, maybe a little bit more forceful. I think he's really going to push, if not demand, for the hostages to be released as part of a negotiation. And in part, that doing so is the best way to ensure that you get humanitarian aid into the Gaza Strip. Part of the negotiation is about a six-week pause, as you mentioned up top. And that six-week pause will allow aid to rush in in a way that we haven't seen in months, really probably since the November pause, despite the fact that there's been new quarters that have tried to be open. But I also think he's going to reiterate Israel's right to defend itself and the necessity to do a better job of to protect innocent Palestinian lives, thousands of whom, of course, have been lost. Uh, absolutely. And of course, to your point on aid getting into Gaza, the administration has begun airlifting aid into the Gaza Strip, something we typically do when we need to get around adversaries. And yet this is Israel, an ally that we are speaking of. What signal do you derive from that, but also the language we are hearing now out of the administration about the nature of the U.S.-Israel relationship right now? Is it becoming a bit more troubled? So I think on the aid part, there's two parts of this. One is there's a real security challenge, as we saw in the horrific incident late last yeah. week about whether people to be able to provide security to deliver the aid. The other challenge is certainly that Israel has not opened as much crossings and provided the support that the U.S. has been pushing for in a much more forceful way now for probably about a month or so. I, I think it does reflect a broader split between where the Biden administration 
administration is and where Prime Minister Netanyahu is. I think that's a split that you're seeing play out in real time with Benny Gantz in Washington, D.C., against the wishes of Prime Minister Netanyahu. Um, he nevertheless met with Vice President Harris. He met with senior members of the NSC. He's going to see Tony Blinken tomorrow, the Secretary of State. And so I think you're starting to see some of those tensions come to the fold. But in the end, I still think that the U.S. and, and President Biden in particular is committed to really trying to ensure Israel's security, but do it in a way that provides maybe more relief to Palestinians who have been suffering and really, really struggling in such a horrific way. Well, as you said, Jonathan, Israel says it will not send negotiators to Cairo unless it gets that list uh, of hostages from Hamas. As long as that's the case, if you don't believe Hamas can generate all of that information to the satisfaction of Benjamin Netanyahu, what are we talking about here? There, that means no one goes to Cairo, right? So a couple things. One, I think it's possible um, that Hamas probably can generate the list or something close to it that might be sufficient for Israel. Um, the other option is, look, just because Israelis won't go to Cairo doesn't mean you might not have American officials or even Egyptian officials go to Israel. From the very beginning, mm -hmm. this hasn't been a direct negotiation, obviously. The Qataris and the Egyptians yeah. have been mediators. We saw they met in Paris along with CIA Director Bill Burns um, not long ago to try to create the framework for this deal. So I think there are ways to get around this. But it's going to take time. And while I'm cautiously optimistic, it is far from a sure thing at this point. And Jonathan, of course, while we've continually paid attention to what's happening in Gaza and the direct conflict between Israel and Hamas, there also has been a lot of concern about spillover into the wider Middle East, although it does feel like that conversation has died down a bit, as we saw the U.S. conducting airstrikes going directly after Houthi targets in Yemen, for example. Can you just give us a reality check uh, of how hot things are still in the region? Yeah, I, I think they're actually pretty hot. I, I do think that the Houthi challenge has slightly calmed as you see the U.S. coalition, U.S.-led coalition, continuing to go after the Houthis in a pretty strong way. Uh, on the other hand, I think there's increasing concern about tensions in the north of Israel along the Lebanon-Israel border. You're seeing more and more Israeli officials talk about the need to go after Hezbollah in Lebanon, and with the potential for that to trigger what would be a broader war, I, I think, is actually growing. There was really a lot of concern when this conflict erupted in October that that would happen. It really has kind of waned since as Hezbollah and Israel got into almost a pattern of back and forth volleys. But now more and more you're hearing Israelis talk about um, the need to go after Hezbollah in the same way they're going after Hamas. If that were to happen or if Hezbollah thinks that's going to happen and try to act preemptively, then you're in a whole different ballgame. Hezbollah's weapons inventory is much, much more advanced than Hamas's, and that would be a real challenge for Israel. Um, the other point I'd raise is the West Bank. You're seeing increased tensions in the West Bank. And really the potential for another intifada, frankly, I think is growing. And so those are really the arenas that I'd start to watch next. Our thanks to Jonathan Panikoff, director of the Scowcroft Middle East Security Initiative at the Atlantic Council. It's good to see you, Jonathan. Coming up, we'll be joined by Colorado's Secretary of State. Jenna Griswold will join with her take on the Supreme Court's ruling that Donald Trump can, in fact, appear on presidential ballots, including in her state of Colorado. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg TV and radio. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg TV and radio. As we learned earlier today from the Supreme Court, former President Donald Trump will stay on the ballot as he scored a major legal victory here. The Supreme Court overturning a decision by Colorado's highest court that had removed him from the 2024 ballots. Joining us now is Colorado's Secretary of State, Jenna Griswold. Madam Secretary, it's great to have you with us today on Bloomberg, an important day for you. Do you feel betrayed by the liberal justices on the court? Thanks for having me on, and absolutely not. Uh, my, my reaction foremost is that I am glad the Supreme Court issued a decision. 
Americans will be voting today and tomorrow across the nation, especially in states where there's early voting, and they deserve to know whether or not Trump is an eligible candidate. But be beyond that, I am disappointed in the decision. I do believe it is up to a state to decide whether uh, to put an oath-breaking insurrectionist onto our ballots or not. The Supreme Court obviously disagrees. And of course, the state of Colorado will follow the Supreme Court's decision. Well, in fact, it was what the Supreme Court decided was that it is not up to a state when it comes to a federal office like the presidency. It is up to Congress. What would you like to see Congress do with that information? That's right. So the Supreme Court said Congress would have to act first uh, to effectuate Section 3 of the 14th Amendment, which disqualifies oath-breaking insurrectionists. And I think logistically, this is basically a uh, uh, run for office, no questions asked for federal or oath-breaking insurrectionist candidates, uh, because the likelihood of this Congress passing any type of law restricting oath breakers from running for uh, federal office is, is highly unlikely. Do you still believe Donald Trump is an oath breaking insurrectionist? I do. The United States Supreme Court did not tackle that question. And only two courts in the United States have looked at the question of whether Donald Trump engaged in insurrection. They both agreed that he did. And I think the bigger picture is that January 6th was just part of Trump's attempts to steal the 2020 presidential election from the American people. Uh, he incited the insurrection. He incited that violent mob onto Congress. And his attacks on our democracy have not stopped. And I think just looking at some of uh, the, the recent statements and news, MAGA extremists are already trying to sow doubt about 2024. Well, and as we look to voting in 2024, of course, it will be happening in your state tomorrow. And Donald Trump, because of the Supreme Court, will be appearing on the ballot. What kind of turnout are you expecting in the Republican primary tomorrow? Colorado is considered the nation's gold standard for our elections, both in terms of access and security, uh, in part because we send a mail ballot to every active voter and we also have early voting. So actually, ballots went out the week of February 12th, and Coloradans have already been voting. In the Republican primary, as of last night, over 500,000 ballots were already processed. We're expecting a, a pretty big uptick in voting uh, today and then tomorrow. And ultimately, it's just so important for Coloradans and all Americans to make their voices heard in these crucial presidential primaries. And to be clear, Secretary, Donald Trump was on that ballot, right? You're not reprinting ballots tonight. All the candidates will, in fact, be on that ballot tomorrow. That's exactly right. And it, it would be logistically impossible to print ballots so quickly. So he is on the ballot because even though the Colorado Supreme Court said that he was disqualified, disqualified, they said to put him on the ballot as long as there was an active appeal to the United States Supreme Court. So he has been on the ballot this entire time, uh, and Coloradans will be able to vote for him. All right, Colorado Secretary of State Jenna Griswold, thank you so much for joining us this evening. We appreciate your time. Thank you. Now coming up, it's not just in Colorado. Elections are taking center stage all across the country as we look ahead to Super Tuesday. We'll have more with our political panel next. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg TV and radio. I have so every the intention of going to Super Tuesday. We're headed to the Super Tuesday state. We'll go into Super Tuesday. We've got Super Tuesday. The people want a choice. We're going to give them that. Look, I will continue to take the cuts and the bruises and the pain and the insults because I think America's worth it. All I ask is that you stand with me as I do it and take that voice all the way to the Super Tuesday states because it matters. That was Republican presidential candidate Nikki Haley making it clear she's headed to Super Tuesday. Well, what happens after tomorrow?
Joining us now is our political panel, Rick Davis, partner at Stonecourt Capital, and Jeannie Shanzano, political science professor at Iona University. So, Rick, she's in it through tomorrow. The question is, what happens beyond tomorrow if she, as very well could happen, does not win a single state? That was so nice to see a clip of someone who was not insulting anybody, not giving anybody <laughs> nicknames. I mean, it was actually like old-style politics. You actually had a communication. Uh, look, I think she's got some thresholds she's got to meet. I mean, like, okay, fine. You're making it all the way to Super Tuesday. Are you going to get over 20% in each state, right? That's number in one. In each state. In each state, because that's a threshold to get delegates, right? And so if you're in it for delegates, and we heard from Governor Sununu that she's collecting delegates, this is a real deal here, then you got to be able to at least get that much. And then are there other states, maybe the northern states like Maine or Vermont, where you can get 40% like you did in New Hampshire, make it look like Donald Trump lacks support amongst the GOP regulars in those states. If those things happen... I think that, one, she may actually see additional fundraising, which gives her a chance to maybe go on to the next round. I mean, it wouldn't surprise me that that would be her announcement uh, at the end of Super Tuesday. As opposed to dropping out. Does she need to win anything, Jeannie? You know, maybe like Rick says something in New England, maybe she, she brings down the swing state of Massachusetts. Does that keep her going to the next contest? Yeah, I mean, if she wins something, that would <laughs> help very much. We shouldn't overlook the fact she did win D.C. over the weekend, where you all are. That's right. Um, and so that, that she did get. I believe the RNC rules are, though, in order to get the nomination, you have to win five. So I do believe she's got four more to go, and I don't suspect she's going to pick up many more. I mean, I think the reality of what's happening on the RNC side is that Donald Trump has really sewn up this party and is very, very close to being the presumptive nominee. Um, and it's not just as he looks to overtake and, and to sort of lord over the Republican National Convention at the national level, but I think he has done, to his credit, remarkable work in making sure the parties in the states he needs are designed and the rules are designed in ways that help him as he moves forward. And I think we're seeing the fruits of that labor. This is a much better Trump campaign in 2024 than it was in either 2020 or 2016, and the numbers show it. Well, Jeannie, as we talk about the Trump campaign, and maybe it's well run or better run than in his campaigns prior, to Rick's point about the idea Nikki Haley could still be getting 20-plus percent of the vote in these states, how much weakness does that signal on the part of Trump's candidacy if he's looking at what is going to be a very long general election contest against Joe Biden? Yeah, I like how you stress that, Kaylee. Very long indeed. <laughs> so <laughs> Wednesday, we start the general. We have three glorious more months than usual. Um, you know, I think that for, <laughs> for Donald Trump, um, you know, he, we have seen the weakness in the coalition. And we've seen that to Rick's point with, when we saw it in South Carolina. We certainly saw it in New Hampshire. This, you know, between 25 and 40 percent who are going out and voting for somebody other than Donald Trump. One big thing to watch for tomorrow night is do we see a re repeat of that. And if so, it underscores this weakness. Um, and, you know, that's something he has to watch out for. I think the, the confounding thing for me is in a normal election year, the front runner like Donald Trump would look at this and he would try to appeal to those independents and those moderate voters, those establishment Republicans. He's doing anything but that. Over the weekend, he was out saying, this is a MAGA party. We don't need the likes of Mitt Romney here. So, you know, it is the old Donald Trump who does everything in violation of any normal rule of politics, which at this point would be to reach to the middle and to try to coalesce support behind you. He's not doing any of that. Rick, Governor Sununu didn't want to talk about projections from the Trump campaign uh, on when they might hit the magic number, but it looks like March uh, 19th, if not the 12th, if he runs the board, I guess, tomorrow. Uh, this feels pretty different when it's not mathematically possible anymore. The, when he says the window's closing, are those the dates they're looking at? Yeah, look, I mean, my own experience in 2008 uh, uh, or in 2000 when I was running the McCain campaign, after Super Tuesday, we mathematically could not win, right? I mean, it just, you know, you could run the tables and still not get yeah. there. Uh, the reality of it is that you weren't going to do that. Trump's not going to get 90% of the vote on Super Tuesday. So he might have to wait till the 12th or the 19th. Mm -hmm. uh, but the reality is that I don't think anybody presumes that Nikki Haley has a mathematical formula to win the nomination. As Jeannie points out, winning D.C. does not get you a ticket 
to the convention. Yeah. And so um, you have to wonder how long can she extend this. Uh, she already has extended it much longer than anybody suspected. When we were in freezing cold yeah. New Hampshire, nobody <laughs> thought she'd make it outside of South That's Carolina. Right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And she has, and she's being very credible in her campaign. So uh, as long as she can maintain uh, momentum, credibility, and fundraising, uh, she has a reason to be out there. And as Jeannie points out, she is extending that primary campaign for Donald Trump when Joe Biden has really never had one. Mm. So uh, advantage Biden in regards of being able to pivot to the general election before Trump really has the, the ability to do it. Nikki Haley is still making news, and that causes him all kinds of consternation. Well, Jeannie, on the subject of Joe Biden, we did get a pair of polls out over the last few days, one perhaps from New York Times CNN. Less good news for the incumbent President Biden, 43 percent support to Trump's 48. There was a Wall Street Journal poll, though, that showed improvement in the way voters are thinking about the economy. The numbers are still relatively low, but they are heading in the right direction if you're the incumbent president. Should Biden look at figures like that? And, and feel better as he gets ready for the State of the Union on Thursday? Or does it just show how much work he still has yet to do? I mean, the polls over the weekend, except for the one you mentioned, the Wall Street Journal on the economic outlook picking up slightly, were just devastating for the Biden campaign and the Democrats overall. The numbers show enormous weakness. They have to look at these two demographics carefully. African Americans and young people. They can't just win them even narrowly. They have to get them in big numbers and they've got to get them out. This has been a perennial problem for him. And my hope is that they don't look at that Wall Street Journal poll and those numbers on the economy and say, oh, let's just wait and hopefully at some point people will wake up and realize they have a lot to celebrate in terms of the economy. So, you know, I think they have to be very careful. So much work to do. Judy Shanzano and Rick Davis, we thank you. We thank you for joining us on Balance of Power. We'll have a special edition of Balance of Power and special coverage of Super Tuesday from 9 p.m. to 11 p.m. here on Bloomberg TV and radio. Rick and Jeannie will be with us. Kaylee, we'll see you then. This is Bloomberg.